vēlos sākt šo sarunu. Un šo sarunu organizē dizaina birojas HDV un segda Rīgas nodeļa. Segda ir starptautiska bezpējas organizācija, kuras mērķis ir diskutēt runāt par dizainu. Un mēs esam šīs segda organizācijas Rīgas nodeļas izveidotāji un arī vadītāji. Un sarunā vispirms tādā ievada daļā runās Ingu un Elere, kas ir dizaina birojā HDV vadošā dizainera un partnera. Un Ingu un mazliet ievirzīs sarunā par to, kāpēc mēs tieši runājam par navigācijas dizainu, kādēļ tas ir svarīgi un būtiski Latvijas kontekstā. Un savukārt pēc Ingu un es tad saicināšu ar savu pieredzi dalīties Despinu Makris un Marka Ross, kas ir dot daš uzņēmuma, Austrālijā bāzēta uzņēmuma izveidotāji un arī vadītāji un vadošie dizaineri. Un mums ir tā lieliskā iespēja, ja būs tā lieliskā iespēja dzirdēt viņu vairāk kā 30 gadu pieredzes stāstu, tieši strādājot ar navigācijas dizainu. Dodaša kompānijai Markam un Despinai ir ļoti liela pieredze arī strādājot ar gan mazajiem, gan lielajiem objektiem, projektiem, kā jau es teicu, sākot ar skolām, universitātēm, dažādām medicīnas iestādēm, publiskām telpām, iekštelpām, ārtelpām. Viņi ir strādājuši arī pie olimpisko spēju, norišas vietu, navigācijas dizainu. Tad došu vārdu Ingūnai. Labrīt visiem, mans vārds ir Ingu un Elēra, un es veikšu tādu ievadu nedaudz pirms šīs te Despins un Marka lekcijas ar to, kāpēc mums Latvijā ir svarīgi runāt par navigācijas dizainu un tieši tagad. Jo mūsu prāt, navigācijas dizains līdz šim ir vēl neizmantots potenciāls Latvijā. Mēs saskatām, ka ir daudz iespējas, un mums ir svarīgi nevis kopēt, bet apgūt citu pieredzi un uz tā balstoties radīt savu unikālo risinājumu, kas ir atbilstoši vietai un kontekstam. Un, jā, kā jau Dagnī minēja, šis notiek SEGD kontekstā, kas ir organizācija radīta 72. gadā, apvienojoties arhitektiem, dizaineriem, pilsētu plānotājiem, ainavu arhitektiem, tieši, lai runātu par vides un grafikas miedarbību. Un šī organizācija ir brīnišķīgs taip profesionāli, bezpējums organizācija, kā resurs arī studēt citu pieredzes, pirms veikt arī kaut kādus savus nākamos darbus. Navigācijas dizaini – šie ir jautājumi, ar kuriem mēs saskaramies ikviens un uz kuriem ir jāatbild navigācijas dizainam un jāatbild sistēmas veidā, dotajā vietā un dotajā laika nogrieznī. Un centrā liekot tomēr šo lietotāju un tā dažādās vajadzības. Un es atļaušos četrus tādus tēžu punktus ievadām tomēr teikt, ka vai mēs Latvijā neesam pati bagātākā valsts. Un līdz ar to ir jautājums, vai mēs varam atļauties slikti dizainētas procesus un pakalpojumus. Pirms mēs kaut ko darām, un tā ir ilgtermiņa ietekme navigācijā, kas kalpo nevis vienu gadu vai trīs mēnešus, bet desmit gadus. Mums ir ļoti jāizsver šie te procesi un jāveicina šis te izcilais rezultāts. Vēl viena lieta, kas bieži ir sastopama, strādājot ar tādu navigācijas dizainu, cik mums ir nācies saskarties, ir, ka par šo izpratnes un pieredzes trūkumu. Un tamdēļ arī mēs veidojam šo te sarunu, lai runāt ar cilvēkiem, kas ir daudz pieredzējušāki par mums un tieši specifiski šajā navigācijas dizainu jomā daloties ar savu pieredzi. Jo bieži vien, kā rodās navigācijas dizains, ir dizaineram, ka ir vajadzīgs pasūtījums. Un pasūtījumi, ja ir gudrs pasūtītājs, būs arī labs navigācijas dizains vai vispār dizains. Un tā bieži vien ir kaut vai šī darba uzdevuma formulēšana. Un lai formulētu labu darba uzdevumu, ir jāizprot, ko var sniegt un ko var sasniegt šis navigācijas dizains. Un arī izprast šo procesu plānošanu laika nogrieznī. Tas nav darbs uz mēnesim, tas ir darbs gadiem, kas tiek veidots ar navigācijas dizainu. Otrais tāds aspekts, ka pilsēta iekštāpa, tā ir šī vieta saruna ar tās lietotāju. 
mēs, mums ir tā brīvība, jo projām staigāt pa ielām, staigāt pa telpām, mums, protams, mobilās ierīces var palīdzēt orientēties, bet mēs nevēlamies staigāt nodurtu galvu tikai savos, savās viedierīcēs. Tas ir tas, ko labs navigācijas dizains var darīt – veicināt šo te skatīšanos bez digitālām ierīcēm, lai, lai, lai šī vieta un vide būtu saprotama. Un bieži vien tas tā ir tā, ir, tā, tā, ir tā neizmantotā iespēja, kas, kas līdz šim mums ir navigācijas dizainā. Trešais aspekts, tas noved arī, ka katra vieta ir tomēr unikāla, katrā vietā ir savs gars, katrā vietā ir savi mērķi, pozicionējums, Kas, kas būtu jāņem vērā, nav divu vienādu situāciju. Mēs nevaram nokopēt ne Austrālijas pieredze, ne, ne Londonas pieredze, jo mums ir sava pieredze, kas, kas veidojas tieši šeit mūsu klimatiskajā zonā, mūsu vēsturiskajā zonā, mūsu izjūtā, laika izjūtā. Despina bija tā, kas esot Latvijā pamanīja vienu mūsu nacionālo īpatnību, ka mēs navigāciju skaitam laikā, kas citur ko viņi citur pasaulē nav redzējis, ka mēs sakam, ka attālumu mēs sakam minūtēs, kad līdz mākslas akadēmijai pieņemsim ir trīs minūtes, līdz, līdz stacijai piecas minūtes, kas, 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 kas ir tāda mūsu īpatnība. Un tad ņemot vērā runāt par šo te zī, vidi un zīmolu, kad šis ir tas aktivitāšu spektrs, kas būtu jāņem vērā. Navigācija nav vienveidīga, tā sastāv no vairākām daļām. Tā ir gan šīta jātiešām, šīta navigācija, bet tās ir arī interpretatīvās zīmes un tās ir vietas tēlu veidojošās zīmes. Mums ir ļoti labi piemēri. Mums ir, mums ir valda cēluma 78. gadā radītā zīmētā šī Rīgas robežas zīme izcila. Tā ir profesionāla, tā ir ilgtermiņā, tā ir pārlaicīga un vietu raksturojoša. Es lapojos iebraucot Rīgā, kad redzu šo zīmi, un viņi ir izturējusi laika pārbaudi. Mums ir Holger Eller veidotājs 800 gadus objekts, kas bija plānots uz trim mēnešiem, bet stāv jau Rīgā, manuprāt, 20 gadi, kas no tāda īslaicīga ir pārvērtusies par viedzīmi jau ilglaicīgu. Mēs šeit ir viens no mūsu projektiem, kas ir veidots veclaicenē kornetu gravā, lai, lai iezīmētu tādu vietas to, kas ir unikāls šai vietai, kad tā daba un fauna, kas atrodas zivis, kas dzīvo šajā ezerā, to lielumi ar iespēju, kad ja tu staigā par šīm dabas takām, tad tev ir iespēja saprast un izprast, kas, kas slēpjās šajos dīķos, gravās, mežos, kādi dzīvnieki, kādi, kādi putni, arī dabīgajos lielumos četrās valodās. Šī te interpretatīvā navigācija attiecās arī uz, pieņemsim, uz iekštāpām, kā šī gadījumā, kur mēs ar ļoti minimāliem līdzekļiem varam mainīt cilvēku arī uzvedību, kā pieņemsim Stokmana tranzīta zona, kur ne tikai nonavigēt skaidri stāvus, bet arī veicināt cilvēku pārvietošanos par trepēm, nevis braukšanu ar liftu. Tā kā uzskaitot, cik katrs pakāpiens kalorijas satur. Un kā šajā gadījumā mēs, kad pirmā stāvā 27. pakāpienā cilvēks ļoti ņipri vēl skrien augšā, tad pie 110. pakāpiena viņš jau ir piekusis no šī kāpiena augšu. Un, un, un tad šīs te trešā grupa norādošās zīmes, kas skaidri rāda pa labi, ir, ir izstāžu zālē un labi arīcības pa kreisi dārzu mājā vai veikalā pa labi ir tāds veikals vai cits veikals, vai nonākot vietā mēs pasakam uz to, kur ir jāiet uz kuru pusi, tātad par šo daudzveidību. Un tad ir pēdējais punkts, ko es gribētu teikt, kad domājot par šodien atsparoties, šodien atsparoties domāt jau par rītdienu, Arī domājot par visu šo situāciju, kas mums ir, par to, kādas būs vispār šīs te informatīvās zīmes, kurām jāņem vērā arī šis te epidemioloģiskie aspekti, ziņas, kas būs jānodod ātri, arī publiskā telpā, ne tikai iekštelpā, bet arī ārtelpā. Ņemot vērā šos te divus zīmes tipus, zīmes, kuras mums ir jāredz, kā pieņemsim, pat reiz Covid norādas, un kā zīmes, kuras mēs vēlamies redzēt intuitīvi. Uh, 
pieņemsim par, par šodien situāciju, par šīm te Covid norādēm, kad no tāda īstermiņa risinājuma, kad kā mēs varam nonākt līdz, līdz tādai cieņpilnai komunikācijai, kas ieņem, mūsu, kas ieņem šo vietu tādā ilgtermiņā. Un kāpēc rīcības maiņa? kad arī navigācija var mudināt uz, uz rīcības maiņu, kā pieņemsim šīnī gadījumā, vai kurš mums ir efektīgāks līdzeklis dezinficēt rokas, vai šī noliktā lapiņa, vai, vai, vai skaidri pausts norāda, kad, kad šajā vietā tas ir iespējams, vai šie epidemioloģiskie baušļi šobrīd šai konkrētai situācijai, vai rīcības maiņa mainīt virzienus, kad labās puses kustība ieturēt ne tikai uz ielas, bet arī iekštaupās. Ar to es gribētu noslēgt šo te savu ievadu un īso, un gribētu teikt, ka mums ir jau daudz labu piemēru Latvijā, un, bet mums ir arī ļoti, ļoti daudz vietas izaugsmē, kuras mēs saskatām. Un dot daš, mēs esam uzaicinājuši kā partnerus un profesionāļus, kuriem ir tiešām 30 gadu pieredze specifiski šajā jomā. Viņi ir studējuši caur praksi, izurbušies cauri visiem šiem te navigācijas dizainu principiem, un viņi zina arī Latviju. Un vēl pie vienā Despina Makris arī sekda organizācijas valdes locekla, Un Despina ir bijusi arī Latvijā, un tas ir tas, ko, ko viņi ir saskatījuši šeit, kad mums ir daudz labas lietas jautājums, kā mēs viņas varam likt lietā. Ar šo es nobeidzu savu daļu, dodot vārdu na, otrai daļai, galvenai daļai. Ok, thank you, Inguna. And uh, now um, I will say uh, to Despina and Mark, that stage is yours and we can change our presentations. Um, as I said already, and uh, Singuna said that the Spina and Mark have a huge experience in wayfinding design in uh, different like fields, in, in public spaces, uh, bigger and smaller ones. And uh, they will absolutely say or share their experience with us and uh, feel free to ask any questions and raise discussion or talk uh, after they will finish. And yes, Despina and Mark, uh, feel free to start. Great, thank you very much. Um, we'll be speaking in English. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we're really excited to be here. We think this is a great initiative to have um, to talk about wayfinding with so many different people from across different industries and disciplines. So, um, and we think this is a very universal design discipline. So I think we'll get started. Can everybody see that? Not now. Yes. Yes, good. Very good. So as wayfinding design consultants, this is a question that we are often asked when we meet people socially. So tonight, today, we wanted to explain this from first principles and go back to the roots. Wayfinding, we see as a multi-sensory process that can engage all the senses and combine real-time mental calculations and memory to navigate spaces. It is used by insects, animals, and humans to help them fulfill the many needs in their lives. Wayfinding processes are fundamental to their survival. Bees, birds, beetles, butterflies, whales, turtles, moths, use a range of sensors to respond to natural forces like the seasons, the sun, the moon, the Earth's magnetic field, physical landmarks to navigate thousands of kilometres. These response systems are built into their DNA. They are born knowing what to do. What drives these processes are the, are the needs to gather food and eat, build homes, multiply, raise their young and eventually die and continue their species. 
Many of these animal navigation processes are still a mystery to science. And for humans, the same needs are also relevant. But in our advanced and complex worlds, where we have an abundance of choice, these needs have been combined with wants. Rather than, I must find food, we humans think, I feel like pizza tonight. Is there a good Italian restaurant nearby? And along with this, our environments are becoming more dense, complex, and often unfamiliar, and not always very friendly. So the fundamental needs still exist in wayfinding processes. To create security and safety in the built environment, to find relevant information and ease of access, to find, to have confidence and peace of mind and minimize stress, in potentially stressful environments and to maintain social sociability and community. This leads to the notion of intuitive wayfinding where people will instinctively read urban environments to make wayfinding decisions. The book the image of the city written in 1960 by Kevin Lynch considered the human experience in the built environment. Through his research, he found that paths, edges, districts, nodes, and landmarks were key elements to help people understand and remember the cities they live in or visit. This is the first book that established wayfinding as an important consideration in city design and planning. Intuitive wayfinding is supported by good urban and public space design and can also include landmarks, community nodes, lighting, public art, landscape, and other noise and activity that will attract people to spaces and influence intuitive wayfinding decisions. Of course, this also makes spaces more enjoyable to be in. Wayfinding design looks at how to address these needs in the same way architectural design provides shelter, comfort, security, and connected spaces and human well being. So what is wayfinding design? Wayfinding design introduces strategically planned information that assists people to navigate and use an environment. It is a service that your organization provides for your customers, users and guests to help them understand their environment and make informed decisions that benefits them and also your organization. This includes all types of environments that may be unfamiliar and complex, such as city centers, major transport stations, hospitals, urban precincts and university campuses. The key goals to be achieved, first of all, know your point of origin, where you are at the beginning of your journey. Be able to assess your progress as you travel. Are you still going the right way? And then finally, most importantly, know when you've arrived. 
And this is one small little cycle that, that gets repeated many times throughout a trip to a city centre or to a hospital or to an airport. One big journey is made up of these little sequences. So how do we, how do we communicate this information? This is usually in the form of signing systems that should ultimately be a holistic system. A holistic system that considers all platforms of communication media, such as journey planning on a website, reading brochures, using digital media and apps, reading signs, face-to-face -face contact, correspondence and writing, and maps, handheld or or digital, all these things form the many touch points that people need to fully um, plan, prepare and understand their environment. So the design process, the design process we'll discuss briefly includes the notion of an analysis process, design you know, a strategic process in terms of strategic thinking, design and implementation. We'll reference a project that's actually uh, a larger sort of government area and focus on one site. So this is a, um, a seaside village in southeast Queensland. Um, first of all, we want to understand the context of the village, how it sits in, in, in the relation to major pathways and roads and what are the nearby things that uh, influence that village and feed off that village. We want to zoom into that village and understand where the key pathways are, um, what are the key precincts for potentially recreation, for business, for, for retail, um, for sports and events and how, how people circulate. We start to also talk to the public and ask them questions. What are their needs? What do they want to find when they're here? What are they looking for? Um, we start to understand the information that they give us. Where are they from? Are they local? Are they visitors? How familiar are they with the place? What do they come here for? How often do they come? And importantly, how do they come? We ask them what they're aware of in these places. Do they, what knowledge of the place do they have to begin with? And just get some sense of their, their sense of how easy it is to navigate that space. And then, and then we ask them basically further questions on, on what they need to help them. Um, while we ask all these questions, ultimately the design of a wayfinding system has to start at first principles and has to start for the first time visitor who, who knows very little about, about the environment. We also start to build up a, a, quite a comprehensive list of all the destinations as a hierarchy, all the places people need to go or want to go based on you know, functional use of the space. So there may be key areas such as major streets, uh, transport nodes, gathering areas, cultural centres, parklands, um, other civic areas, schools, um, and particular destinations or points of interest, as well as services, you know, such as toilets. We start to understand the way people use the space in terms of how vehicles might travel and find their car parks. We understand how cyclists might use it because there's a beautiful coast, coastal pathway as well as inner city roads. We want to understand how pe pedestrians use it, how they have major and minor paths. And of course, vehicle drivers immediately become pedestrians once they park their car. So at what points do they enter the city? We start to build up a hierarchy of routes. We start to plot information. We start to look at uh, what information we're giving them at what time in terms of decision, decision making points.
we start to develop the graphic standards that, that communicates this design intent and we're looking for clarity, legibility, simplicity in the graphics. So I'm just going to jump in here now. Um, so Mark and I have two um, quite distinct areas that we work in as a team. So um, Mark comes very much from a, an overall holistic view, uh, strategic planning. He considers from the beginning to the end and all the pinch points. Um, my particular area that I work in is in visual communication. So this is a really Brief, this is a very brief snapshot of our work. Um, and what we, what we haven't included is prior to showing you this graphics section, there would have been a, a piece of work that was done in and around the user groups, in and around contextually what is authentic to that place. Um, in this instance, we're working in a local government area that has coastal, is a quite a large, I think probably 200 square kilometres. It's a large um, civic centre, but it has a coastline, it has an urban corridor, and then it has um, a kind of woodlands, if you like. So how do you unite all of that through a visual communication strategy? So there would have been a visual communication strategy to proceed this piece of work. In the end, um, particularly to do with um, the, the typography, we, we looked to a font that was able to capture the kind of countryside and the history as well as the modern and the progressive. So uh, we alternated with a font that had a serif and a sans. So these are the kind of things that we take into consideration when we're doing a visual communication strategy. Um, if Mark goes to the next slide, we often will work with international standard pictograms unless, um, a, a, because we're working in public realm uh, and we have to be mindful that uh, information needs to be communicated as quickly as possible. In this particular instance, we're not looking to push the envelope design-wise in terms of the expressive language. There are other projects that we have worked on cultural centres, for example, where we will design a bespoke set of pictograms because it's more fitting and authentic to the environment or that sector. But here we work with international pictograms, but you can see we start to work with them in such a way that it, it builds on the identity that we're building from the ground up. So rather than a kind of marketing campaign, we're really looking at building identity through authenticity of place. Thank you, Despina. <laughs> so we just, we'll just continue on with um, visual language. Um, arrows are very big in our world in visual communication. They play a very, very important role. Um, yeah. And uh, this is the colour scheme. I think you can see here, as I said, there's a, a body of work preceding this um, and this would have been through a process with our client, the stakeholders, uh, the urban planners, you know, the civic authorities. So uh, a blue for the coastal, oranges and reds, yellows, oranges and yellows for the urban and for the hinterland, the greens. And um, what is particularly um, significant for us in wayfinding is we have to have very high contrast because our signage um, in the end, the visual communication has to be very legible because it's often read at, uh, at speed with vehicles and or pedestrians from distances. So high contrast is why we use very highly saturated colours because we can reverse whites and um, blacks. And in Australia, we also have a standard. We have to have a 30% contrast. So onto the material palette. Um, in, in this instance, for this particular project, we also um, looked at um, expressing the, the coastal, the urban and the hinterland through various material palettes. Um, when on the coast, you, you know, we're clearly looking at a material that not only kind of resembles sand, obviously, but can withstand salt, water and wind and heat. So this is a concrete. And then we've used, because the, the hinterland and the urban centres are 
originated in, in wood and wood cutting. We have used that as the element to bring forward and express the kind of identity of the towns and the villages and the cities. On to, well, in, in this instance, the, the mapping standards, um, are, are, they have to be clear, concise, and again, reflect um, very much build an identity of, of this particular region. So in this instance, we chose to use a lot of textures. Um, we do a lot of, um, a lot of mapping all very uh, to, to the context always. And reinforcing that point about knowing your point of origin when you start a journey, which is often the hardest thing with maps, so you always tell them where they are. You are here. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we develop a whole suite of signs that works for different, different environments in, for this particular project. And it very much forms that idea of a, of a kit of parts of a system that is kind of adaptable and scalable and, and um, suitable to the different kind of sites that it's going to be applied in. Just looking at the mapping, for instance, we might have one side of the sign will tell you where you are in kind of a, in the local area. So it allows you to know what choices are immediately around you for you to go and visit within a short walk. And then on the other side, in this case, we talk about the whole region, which is you know hundreds of kilometres to travel across as a way of promoting greater awareness of that region. So you might be in one small part down here, but you'll, you'll at least learn a little bit about somewhere else where you might go on another day if you're a tourist. Or you can, it can be a, a step to discover more and learn more and do more. So I would just say that the, these concepts are developed um, after we do all of our reading and our analysis, and then we have put these forward um, as, as, a, as, a, yeah, as an idea, you know, it, this is part of our strategy is to say, well, you can actually discover more and let's, let's promote that through the wayfinding system, through the visual communication. Oh. And just some details of those. Yes. Yep. And just looking at very simple, you know, kind of hierarchy and graphic layout so that it should be relatively easy to read. It should, it should just make sense. You should, your brain should not have to work too hard to read the information and understand the way it's all laid out and it's clear. We maybe give key information such as distance. Um, often you give distance or time. And obviously, <laughs> if you're walking or on a bike, um, time is different. Distance is the same but sort of valuable cues to help you make decisions about um, understanding that environment. So I think this was interesting. And did I hear, Dagnia, because I, I don't understand Latvian, but did I hear you earlier um, make the comment when, when we were walking and I asked you how far something was and you said to me, it is eight minutes. And I was just astounded because we would not do that here in Australia. And, and, you know, I came back and we had a talk in the studio and it was interesting. I think for us, it's, it's more or less, well, that person can't walk that distance in eight minutes. And that's why we give um, a metric. So, yeah, you did. Did you do that earlier? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> Both with Ingo, no? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, we would definitely start to plan signs. It actually gets into more detail where we're looking at messages. We're building up schedules of messages. We're starting to say where each sign is coded and where it goes and how many of them there are. So, so you know, in one kind of village area of those blocks, that's sort of about the kind of information that we're putting in. And then they're designed in detail. So they're, they're structures that need to be properly de designed and, um, and potentially working with engineers in terms of how they fit into the ground um, and connect with whatever they're connecting with in terms of 
are the buildings or walls, but um, that's all part of the design process and looking at resilient structures. I would say that from, from my travels around the world, um, I think in Australia it's quite particular to us, but typically practices like ours would also do the documentation. Um, we would have industrial designers or architects in our studios who would undertake this. I believe in the UK, it's actually almost a separate practice, a separate service. So the design studio might do the top of the, you know, the sort of design concepts and, and um, the development of this type of work. But here, certainly, this work is all done in-house. And then, as Mark said, as we are not engineers, you would have an engineer sign off on on the footings, you know, because of, obviously, because of all the public liabilities, yeah. And, um, you know, we're actively involved during the production and manufacture and the implementation, um, but... Um, here's the final, the here's the final pieces. The blue system is not rolled out yet. So because, you know, these projects happen over many years and as the councils um, come into more funding, they roll more sections of the work out. Um, it would be highly unusual to roll something out for such a large area in one go, but the planning has been done. So the consistency is there. So this was the first of the suites to be rolled out. And obviously it's in an urban area because it's in the oranges. This is a little interpretive project and Ingrid and I saw earlier, you were talking about interpretive. Um, and so in, in this particular local government area, there was a disused railway line, which the council wanted to um, turn into something that was um, active and healthy for young families. So they built a pathway along this disused rail line. And I think it goes for about, the first stage is about 13 kilometers and it's called the rail trail. And so it was an interpretive piece that came from that original um, holistic um, um, visual communication piece. You can see we use this very dynamic line diagram um, taken from transport visual um, communication to outline your mapping is a really critical element of wayfinding. Yeah, so there's a trail here. Okay, my turn, I think. So, um, let's talk about poor wayfinding, all right? It's, we don't often do this, but we, we think it's probably pretty important. And this is not meant to, um, you know, talk about bad signage. It's actually to really talk about what is, what is poor and, you know, it's when it's not valued, when it's not done well. And, and then what are the hidden impacts of this? What does this actually mean? So it means you would spend less time in an environment. So you can see here, it's all very high end, but you know, there's kind of a, like a visual confusion there. I, I can't clearly see where I've got to go, where I'm going to. Um, not knowing all your choices in an environment. And I think all of us will have had experience of, of this. everybody had an experience of that too many too many so so we we would say here there's no progressive disclosure you you've given people information all at once and there's just too many choices um, the next one is we think it's poor if if you are confused you are frustrated or you get lost and by that time that is how you feel So here's a, a statement, if you want to kind of, um, it's often very difficult to get data in and around um, evidence or data in and around cost. Um, but we do have, have this from our own Mata Hospital here in, in Australia. And um, they do, they believe they, they lose about uh, 1 million Australian dollars in staff time helping people who are lost in the hospital. So there is, a, there is an economic um, outcome from poor wayfinding, people being frustrated, lost, uh, yeah. And, th and that's not people who are paid to be helpers, that's people who are going about their daily job who are essentially interrupted and the time that's kind of 
you know, it leaks out of their day into this. Good way of finding. So I think with good way of finding design, while it, you know, it can be difficult to me measure, it's important that good way of finding does essentially create a positive experience for visitors. And, and it's in a place that shows that they care for the visitor. And it, it also should create a greater sense of customer satisfaction and trust and in critical places such as this is where you need to trust the information that you're given. Otherwise, it could have a big impact. Um, it should allow for better use of the facilities. Good way of finding information should mean you can discover everything there is to know in a facility and explore it well, but also use this, you know, know what you're using and use it well. Um, it should contribute to better business, if you like in terms of, once again, making the most of any space. Yeah, this is about retail, retail management and helping the retailers. And it should be less demanding on staff resources. So that, you know, while staff are there for a reason at times, you know, the, the, as we said earlier, the whole system has multiple ways of communicating wayfinding. So we're just going to finish with uh, some snapshots of, our, of, of some projects that we just wanted to share with you. So essentially we work in about 10 sectors and that's um, healthcare, um, public and urban realm, education, major events. We've worked on several Olympic games. Um, it's all on the website. I can't remember all of them, but here's a couple of them now. So, so we want to talk about a number of projects. Sorry, not all these projects we are responsible for. So the first one is Legible London, <laughs> which is um, um, people may be aware of, is by applied information and a range of consultants. And you can best be described as getting people back on the high street of London. And um, I, we wanted to present this as a little case study because it's, it's probably started 10 to 15 years ago and it's still continuing to roll out around the boroughs of London. And, and what it is, it, the, the issue is saying that the underground is obviously a great facility, great infrastructure in London, but it also keeps people underground. And they also often use the underground to only travel what would essentially be a five minute walk. And it probably takes five minutes in the underground too, by the time you get down and you know, catch the train and come back up. And so they want to keep people back on the streets where they can be active um, and, and walking and contributing to the economy, whatever it being, buying, buying lunch, buying a coffee, but, but being involved on the street. And obviously the side benefit is to slightly decongest the underground as well. So it's a system where all the, all the nodes, if you like, getting back to decision nodes, the entry and exit points of undergrounds all, all have fairly substantial pieces of information that tell you where you are in this particular part of London, if you're in Soho and what's nearby, what's around you. Sure, where the other nearest underground stops are and you may say, yes, I've only got a five minute walk and I can walk and then get on the tube. It tells you, you know, the major kind of services and facilities and institutions. So. Um, and it's supported with other things, with even smaller signs of different scales and sizes. It's a very big kit of parts and it's, it's you know, adaptable and scalable, as we said, to sort of fit, fit the kind of London streetscape. But it's, it's ultimately just giving people that confidence and knowledge to, to stay on the street, to move around and probably find they're probably walk, walking a lot further. They're probably a bit fitter and healthier, you know, there's sort of multiple benefits, obviously, you know, if, if all the cities that want to create walkable cities, this is, this is part of that walkability. Um, we, we just wanted to show a few images of, of the 2000 Olympic Games, which was a project we worked on with a number of designers as well. And it, it's really a project about celebrating a big event and celebrating an identity and sort of powerfully doing that through you know, very simple temporary elements, but using strength of color and rhythm. And once again, we have 
um, signage elements. These are a whole series of bus stops, but um, you know, yellow becomes the color for signage. It's considered sort of functional operational color, but some of the other celebratory elements such as banners and these big um, sort of entrance markers and towers used other colors in the palette. So there's still a language going on there. So it's, if you like, this massive big global party that people would um, uh, attend. And obviously speaking in sort of simple graphic forms with thousands of people and visitors running around. Um, do you want to Schiphol. <laughs> We've been trying to practice this one. So um, Schiphol Airport, um, Maxina, a, a, a very seminal piece of work, which is um, a, a kind of a really a wayfinding standard uh, designed in a way where all anything to do with arrivals and departures of flights are coded in yellow. Anything to do with um, exiting the building is coded in green. And on the left-hand side, you can see anything to do with lounges or secondary types of information in blue. So probably one of the most effective um, color-coded wayfinding systems in airports in the world. Um, we'll talk to you about a big uh, a zoo in, um, in Sydney, Australia, that was essentially on a very steep cliffside, harbourside location with many piles. It was really a maze. Um, and their evidence said that many people came. Um, while there were signs around there, they still did not um, understand the space or have a full rich experience. They couldn't get to shows and events on time. Um, the terrain kind of stopped their intuitive wayfinding to kind of go in certain directions. And so we analysed these paths and eventually found what we thought was one key connector path that you could travel on and that all the other paths to the exhibits came, came off this as little side trails. And that was a key part of, of the strategy where you had this big green connector. And we made that absolutely clear on the pathway that you essentially just had to follow the green dots um, and you were safe. And, and when you followed the green dots, you would come to signs and markers that, that would introduce you with mapping and would tell you, you know, what that trail is and where to go. So a very kind of simple, intuitive way of communicating those things. And each trail had a number and um, everybody's given a map when they arrive at the zoo so they can carry it around. Um, well, so Brisbane, which is the city that we're in, um, has quite a broad um, cross-section of international visitors and international students and many from Asian countries. And there was a, a strong decision by the local government to provide a wayfinding system that would have highlight key information um, in multiple languages. So while we still had a, you know, a dominant English and visual elements, this was supported then by four other key languages, including Arabic, Mandarin, Korean and Japanese. And in business terms, what was critical to the local council was that um, people be able to find their way. So people who spoke languages other than English find their way so that, that more money was spent on the high streets. This is the big ROI with wayfinding, the return on investment. They really, they had to stop hiding where everything was and be able to point people to the major um, attractors, the mall, the square, where you're, you know, for, in example, for example, in Riga, where the Freedom Monument is and what spills out from there. And once again, this is, if you like, the approach of a system and a kit of parts. There's a major element that's used for your orientation at major intersections and decision points, and then other directions keep you, keep you on track. <laughs> I think we've just got a couple more just to touch on. Um, so we're talking about a children's 
hospital, the Queensland Children's Hospital, and very much the language and wanting it, wanting to, I mean, people don't usually choose to go to a hospital. They have to go there through necessity, um, whether you're a patient or a visitor. And, um, and it's, so from our point of view, we sort of work with the architects to try and get a level of kind of colour and vibrancy and friendliness into that hospital that um, children would be comfortable in, obviously, and their parents. Um, so very much a strong use of colour and colour coding on levels, simple kind of diagrammatic maps as the usual complexity is um, catching the right lift to get to the right floor. Um, a sporting centre, an aquatic centre, a very kind of clean aquatic um, identity, like in some of the wayfinding that, that sort of we think it integrates with the architecture. Um, simple information that um, helps you get around, obviously providing grounded material near the pool to help you understand the water. In 2010 and 2011 in Brisbane, we had very serious floods on our river and we lost, um, I think it was 11 of our ferry terminals floated down the river. And so a series of new ferry terminals were commissioned and, you know, the city's best architects designed the ferry terminals. Um, and we were fortunate enough to be able to design the wayfinding. Uh, these markers, these very large markers that you see here, and that's and then on land side, the um, marker that attracts you and says you've arrived at the ferry, and then the, how you capture information uh, to, to let people know the timetables and the routes. And then we, the last slide I think is we designed then a diagrammatic map of how the, how the um, ferry routes work on the river. So that was a, you know, out of a lot of disaster, we were very fortunate to work on, on that project. And that's, that is, we have now reached, <laughs> The end. So um, that, that was a very abrupt finish. I'm sorry about that. Um, but that is the end of our presentation. And I have to say it was um, an absolute pleasure putting it together. Um, I, I, there are so many threads that we draw together as wayfinders. I feel like we have just touched the surface. Um, we haven't addressed things like information design. We haven't addressed things like digital. We really wanted to talk to you about first principles, you know, what is wayfinding? And then we have been in practice for 30 years um, and the principles have, have grown, but they've never really changed and they can be applied to analog and digital is how we see things. So we would be very happy to take questions, but I'm going to throw back to Dagnia. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present yeah. to you today. It's, um, it's a real honor. Oh, thank you, Despina and Mark. And uh, yes, we were talking in Latvia a couple of years ago with Despina about this interesting thing that Latvians are saying uh, minutes, not the distance in meters. But I, I would say that we are putting together five minutes walk or five, min five minutes drive. It's also, if someone is driving a car, he's saying five minutes drive. If someone is not driving a car, he's saying five minutes walk or five minutes with a bike or something like that. that that's also a special thing uh, here in Latvia, I think. Uh, but yes, are there, are there any questions or, 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 or comments or, or maybe someone wants to raise a discussion about uh, something? Hello, um, I'm uh, Eva, uh, representing a design studio H2E. And uh, very, very happy to hear you speak. And uh, you covered so much uh, uh, of what we in the office talk about uh, uh, with, with questions. And there's many questions I've written down, but um, um, given your experience, um, um, could you talk a little bit, you talked about understanding how people move around the city. 
And could you talk a little bit about the process uh, of analysis of how you gather this data and how much time do you allocate for that? Um, well, I guess the first thing is we maybe just go and watch. <laughs> um, if, it, if, if that is the project, I mean, there's a lot of different, um, very good. Um, so there's a lot of different types of projects, I guess, and um, some of them are actually new projects. There's nothing built, so there's, there's no one to assess, obviously, um, if it was a new building or a new centre. Um, but we're all time trying to understand how people use spaces. So if it is somewhere existing, we always just try and go and spend time there and observe what happens. Um, ideally, um, we would also um, ask some people some questions. Um, as we said earlier, you know, in terms of why are you here, um, what, do you, what do you need, are you, are, you, um, you know, are you comfortable in the space in terms of understanding the space? So. Um, we, it, it, it sometimes depends on the project and what, what the expectation is of the client, but we generally find, you know, it's fairly um, informal kind of process. We're not, um, like some people might do fairly complex, like engineers might do fairly complex studies on pedestrian flows and numbers, and I think a thing called heat maps, where you're looking at quantities, but we do take the view that in the end, it has to be information that, you know, somebody completely new to the environment can use and read and understand. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think Gunt is still uh, raised the hand. Yes, I did actually. <laughs> um, I'm glad that I got introduced to, to, to your company because I mentioned Legible London in one of my blogs in, in the summer. And maybe the question is kind of um, next uh, to, to the previous one. I'm wondering, you, you mentioned uh, uh, less complicated approach to, to analyzing the, the initial uh, requirements for, for wayfinding in the city. I remember there was uh, in Toronto, 360 strategy of wayfinding, they said something like two or three years we have been analyzing the pedestrian uh, flows and then patterns. And uh, what would be your approach if you be given the, the task to, to get people out on the streets and using less, let's say, cars or public transport? How would you approach that, and what would you expect from the from the city, for instance? Uh, what would be the brief you would would like to have then? Oh, um, mm. well, that's a good question, I guess. Um, and I think so. So somewhere like Toronto, where it's you know, a lot of it's like the path project and things like that. I think isn't that where there's a lot of underground travel? I think, I, I think in, I think with any brief, it's you know. It, it is just, um, I don't know, we would just undertake kind of the observations. We, we need to understand, I guess, um, the goals and desires of the city, how they want people to move around, how it's, you know, what is the city's master plan, how it's going to grow and unfold, and how wayfinding can kind of support that and, and help manage that. Um, and it is, yeah, it is a case of just, immersing yourself in the space, but also hopefully there's usually some existing data and information, or as we say, master planning, starting to get those kind of hierarchies of pathways, even if we want to shift those pathways, you know, even if they're going to change over time because something is going to happen in the city. Um, it's just gathering of that data and then starting to build it up on a plan, I, I guess. And, and then, yeah. Um, and, and a fair bit of consultation with, mm, with the so city, cool. city yeah. designers and team, whether it be sort of to do with architecture and urban planning and engineering, so that we're kind of sort of locking in. But it's probably, I, I, yeah, I'm always surprised at some of these big projects like Legible London, what have you, there, there seems to be such an, 
a huge amount of analysis and data and um, research. And I, I, I often don't understand why sometimes. I think, I think, like I say, I think you've got to, um, you just, you know, sure you have to understand the quantity of people, how they travel and how they move about and how that might change over time. But, um, you know, I, 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 I think there's, as I say, it always has to come back to first principles of pretending that you've come for the first time mm. and, and how, you, how you want people to um, use and understand the space. Mm. Okay, I thanks. Think good. Could, could, you, could, you, could you explain a bit of background because the legible London is kind of a very sizable project and yeah. uh, probably there has been a lot of data given mm. to you. So <laughs> what did you did with them? Uh, we, we, we've only done, we've just looked, seen some initial design documents and we just know there's quite a team of consultants involved and it is now a system that's sold and rolled out. So, and, you know, I guess number one, it seems to be a success story and I think it's more successful, say, than a similar system that's being used in New York, mm -hmm. which is called Walk New York. Um, and I think it's because New York is a bit different and it's a grid. So um, we, we probably haven't seen that much information, to be honest, other than what you, know, you could freely get on the internet. Okay. Mm. Thanks. Mm. Uh, any other questions? Or maybe I can shortly ask also a question. Uh, Despin and Mark, could you maybe share who is the main uh, decision maker before starting uh, a wayfinding design in, in some place, in public place or in a city or somewhere in Australia? What is your experience? Um, well, I think the best way to that, there's probably two types of projects for us and that's one where it is maybe a, a purely a standalone wayfinding design project and there are no other disciplines involved. And that might be a city centre or a parkland, or it'll be usually an existing facility that needs, it may be changing or it simply, it has feedback that it isn't working. So it will be the city, you know, it'll, it could be the architects or the managers or the, what have you say, you know, the people that run the place and they've gathered information, um, they've had feedback and that needs to be improved. So it'll come through that direction or we may, or the other type of project is that we are one consultant in uh, a group of maybe a dozen consultants for a new project, like a new, a new building, a new hospital, a new performing arts theatre in Brisbane at the moment. And there will be lots of consultants and um, architects, engineers, landscape, interior designers, sustainability, um, accessibility, uh, and wayfinding. So, so wayfinding is just in the brief and people know enough about it and they, you know, it's becoming recognised as an important thing um, to, to, you know, it's, it's a critical part of a, of a new building to have good wayfinding so that it isn't an afterthought um, and it's well designed and integrated into the building. So in that case, you know, it'll once again be the, be the government or whoever is instigating the brief. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see that um, Laura maybe can ask. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Despina and Mark, uh, for the very inspiring morning. Um, uh, I'm Laura. I'm also a designer at H2E Design Studio. So, yeah, it was a real pleasure to get this uh, very valuable information right at the time <laughs> when, when it's uh, yeah, most needed. And I had two questions. Uh, the first of them is regards accessibility. And um, as we know, there are also disabled users. And, and how would you work with things like, for example, Braille, uh, the Braille signage and, and things like that? Yeah, what is your experience in, in this matter? Well, so we, we would have a, uh, an Australian standard um, that's based on, I think, international standards and it will specify the minimum 
it will become a code for a building, for the building to be opened to the public and, and certified, it must meet these requirements. And obviously accessibility runs into all sorts of architectural design as well in terms of the slope of ramps and the width of um, hallways and pathways and things like that and, and entryways. And then part of that is signage where you will need to introduce some um, pictograms, obviously some braille and tactile um, information, possibly mapping. Um, and and there's a, so there's a minimum standard that, that is believed by the say the Australian government. Um, but if it's an organisation that believes it needs to have a higher standard, then we would always have that discussion with them in terms of if they want to introduce more braille and tactile information for, you know, it, it, it gets quite um, conflicted sometimes, but it might be a hospital where they want to have a higher level of accessibility, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they might introduce that. And to be honest, sometimes that has to be balanced against their budgets to do it too, because it, it does come at a cost. So they, they still, um, yeah, they will, they will still investigate that and that will be part of the discussion. Excuse me. It is part and parcel of our public realm work, Laura. Mm. All right, thank you. And I also had a second question. Um, you had a very beautiful intro of the presentation where you showed all of these elements in nature, how it's uh, really also in human nature to, to find our way, so to say. And so I wanted to ask uh, maybe a more poetic question, like what is uh, the thing that inspires you most as uh, wayfinding designers in your work? Like uh, I see that uh, nature also plays a part, but maybe, yeah, you have some other ideas. <laughs> I think from a design point of view, it's actually just a real need. I mean, it's like the interface between you and you as human beings and the environment that you're in. And, you know, even in now time on the planet, everything is getting denser and busier. As we said, more complex, more difficult to understand. You, you, you know, you can't see very far sometimes because of the density of the city. So it's wanting to work often with teams and architects to make that notion of wayfinding an important part of their brief. So that's getting back to that notion of intuitive architecture um, where you, yes, I can actually see the front door. I, I know that, you know, it's not just a, a big glass facade and you have to work out which is the piece of glass that's going to move out of the way. Um, so, it's it's just um, yeah it's just it just feels that there's that definite gap in in the world between all the built spaces and then the people that use them and helping them. And Can I answer that, Laura? Yes. So so I get lost and disorientated really easily, and um, I love making information really clear because it really helps me. So I use all of my design skills to untangle the puzzles of too much communication in the built environment. You know, if, if I can find the front door and I can get from A to C without anxiety, then I know everybody else can. So for me as a designer, it's about being purposeful and useful in life. You know, it's not the most glamorous design discipline. It's not super sexy, you know, we don't do marketing, we don't sell products, but hopefully we help people find their way. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ilse, uh, did you want to ask a question? You mean uh, me, Ilse? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I would like to ask um, actually maybe even two questions and uh, if possible to share uh, some uh, photo or, or small presentation with two photos. Dagny, it depends on you to let me do that or it's, yeah? Share? Oh yeah, stop sharing, I guess. Yes. Um, 
My name is Ilz and I'm a journalist, but I'm, uh, I would say, very close uh, uh, links with design and I'm very interested in all processes in design. And um, I just would like to uh, say some, uh, one more example uh, from our culture, uh, because you already mentioned this Latvian way of, uh, of thinking in a minute. And there is uh, one uh, way uh, which is very interesting, I think, uh, to, I think in our uh, nations that uh, we have this, um, I don't know why I can't share all in all um, screen, but maybe you can see in this way. Just yeah, so this is, this is a Latvian a national uh, dance uh, festival, which is happening uh, once in the fourth year. It's uh, one for adults and one for school children. And, uh, and it, uh, it's happening in this uh, football stadium in open air. And uh, you see uh, how different uh, patterns and forms uh, dancers are uh, making. And actually, I think it's also some kind of uh, navigation design because I also dance for a national dance uh, uh, team for t 10 years. And we always uh, need to pick some uh, sign on this uh, field. and and make a straight line or, or maybe in a round. And we made uh, different patterns and it's uh, very interesting, I think, and, and it's very common uh, to our country and our nation. But my question uh, um, comes to another open stage uh, place where the song festival is taking place also every four years in Latvia. So, and here is uh, totally some, um, maybe even, uh, uh, 100,000 people, so that there is uh, approximately 30,000 uh, uh, visitors, uh, so the people who has, um, yeah, as, a, as a, um, viewers, and there is um, participants who is singing on this uh, estrade. And uh, there's also about uh, 40,000 people, and, uh, and uh, the place, uh, uh, this place is taking, um, um, this place is it, um, approximately, again uh, half an hour from Riga city center in a big uh, park and uh, now we we change this uh, new stage and it will uh, look like this approximately and you see it's uh, surrounded um, uh, by forests from all sides and of course uh, there is a um, at least four or five ways how to get in and how to get out from this uh, this area because of course it's uh, some way, uh, in some way closed with some uh, shields and, and other things. And recently, some two days ago, I just passed uh, this place for walking and, uh, and it's, uh, for now it's closed because it's construction work still happening. And I saw this uh, navigation design, which is already put in some places and I really hope that it's not uh, uh, permanent because in all places there is uh, only light gray signs with uh, uh, white letters and the, the my question is uh, uh, how could uh, 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 designers uh, can um, argument to make this uh, navigation design more uh, um, efficient for decision makers or maybe there is not uh, lost everything yet and maybe we could uh, really put the real uh, new nice and 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 design navigation signs for all the singers and 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 people what do you suggest how how did the best way how to argument the people who are making this all construction workers and decision makers thank you when will it open <laughs> It's way of thinking, right? <laughs> I think okay, it's a couple of here's some questions. Do, do people just come? Do they buy, like there's no seats, are there? No, they, they are seats. There will be seats. And do you buy a ticket to a specific seat? Like yes, seat yes, yes. E25 or? Yeah, so. yeah, exactly, yeah. So like any kind of stadium, it'll probably have a hierarchy uh, of an address, like a, a section 
and then maybe yes, an it is. Oil. It is. Yeah, it is. It's already exists, but there's all uh, science around how to get in and how to get out because it's always problem because it's always just like a, a hour of uh, crowds uh, surrounding this this uh, place, this uh, open stage, and then it's just split everywhere in this in the forest. But this one hour, it's actually terrible. Yeah, it's about I, I mean, in something like this, you would want people to circulate to do most of their journey outside, like around that ring road and find their right door that's as near to their seat as possible before they enter the seating area. And you need space to do that. So circulation should be like a primary thing around, around the, shall we call it a stadium? And then, and then you're going either in or up you know, as near as possible to your seat. Um, so, that you, so you, first of all, you'd want to work out the right movement principles. It's the same thing with getting out too, um, making sure they get out as quickly as possible without um, getting all enmeshed. Um, and then on top of that, I, I think it sounds like you're saying the signs themselves don't look very readable. Is that right? Maybe. And that's, that's a different issue. But the first thing is to get the wayfinding model right and decide if they're all, you know, all those entry points leading in are all numbered or coded or something quite simple that everybody understands. And they have tickets. And when they arrive, they know straight away which way, which way around do I go. I'm looking for one, two, three, and then go in three. So, um, and then like, you, like we say, you know, you should even tell them beforehand, like, I, how do they get there? Do they, is there a big car park or are they? No, there is a, some uh, place where you can uh, um, get with a tram from the city center. And then mm. it takes, uh, again, some 20 minutes just to walk till this uh, open stage. And then is a place where you can uh, put around the somewhere uh, behind the forest place where you put uh, um, um, private cars. And then closer to this open stage uh, place is uh, buses for um, participants. So that there is uh, this area always is full with uh, transport and people and it's just like a, a part of this tradition but I think it's uh, yeah it could be make uh, smarter I, I think I guess yeah yeah so so Ilza you're a journalist yeah is that right so, so if, if we take a step back did I did I also hear you say what is a compelling argument to put forward to the people who are building this or designing this to have wayfinding included very early on and not to be an add-on of some signs at the end. So this is what I say to that. I say that wayfinding, so signs are an outcome of wayfinding. You have to try and break this thinking of being reactive. Signs are, we work essentially in communication and you would see that we use that word through our presentation. We are communicators in the built environment. We take the data, we take the evidence, we build investigation, we build strategy, but at the end of the day, we are communicating messages to people in the built environment. And that's, you know, as a journalist, you, you, you would probably have the ability to write the compelling arguments. So in Australia, uh, you know, maybe eight or so years ago, was when we started to see wayfinding embedded in all public tenders because there was money being lost or opportunities lost if you had this old mindset, we're just going to stick some signs up. What are signs? Signs are communications. So at first principles, that's where you start. You have to start to educate, you know, those around you. And we know that in European countries, the culture is much deeper, much richer, much older. So you have a different framework. Whereas in a country like Australia, we're only 200 years old, so we're open to these things, you know, and they, we, we can pivot, we can adapt really quickly. Um, so it's, it's a bigger conversation and one that I'd yes, be very yes, happy to have it. <laughs> yes, so of course. You need to educate and educate and has to be for some reason, you know, generally return on investment. 
Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree, and I, I absolutely agree about uh, um, with with you. And I think yeah, it's 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 the right way how to to make the step by step. And I'm very glad that uh, Inguna's team and, and other designers in Latvia they are making these small steps and show the good examples. And that's uh, that's the lessons for all of us how to do the things better. Okay, thank you so much. And if I may, uh, there was one more question about uh, this COVID uh, time uh, because. Um, we saw and then we 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 still seeing that people are not uh, not uh, not um, uh, making all these uh, rules and they are just uh, trying to avoid uh, from the from uh, from uh, supermarkets and then things like that uh, do you see right now somewhere some specifically created navigation uh, design for how to manage crowd in supermarkets, for example, or some uh, other public space? Because of course there is this small signs, don't be, don't be close to each other, please keep the distance and things like this. But if we, uh, if we go into the supermarket, it mostly doesn't work and I'm, I'm really concerned about it because the, the, the one of the way how we can um, avoid of this uh, virus is just to keep this distance and maybe if, uh, if uh, again these uh, people are smarter they put the, the, the very uh, good uh, signs and, and, way, and make this um, uh, crowd managing uh, better. So the question do you see right now or maybe saw the very good example of this um, navigation specially designed in, in this uh, uh, time. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think the big thing is you're talking about trying to change behaviour yeah. with, with signs and, and that's or, or potentially some kind of thing like that and that's where it's hard. I mean we, Australia is, is quite healthy at the moment. I think we only have a few cases. Um, so, because we're so far away from the rest of the world, <laughs> we're an island. <laughs> um, it's actually, you know, been a, a good thing in some ways. Australia, New Zealand, um, and yes, there's signs. I mean, we used to have a lot of there was such security guards, so big, strong men to kind of <laughs> scare you into doing the right thing. Um, but it does require a, maybe an emotional response rather than a kind of informational response but no we don't we can't really suggest anything everybody's yeah. done everything there's so much graphics on the ground yeah. everywhere patterns and and things and that's often trying to be done in in a humorous way like you know the length of this lizard is 1.5 meters this is how far <laughs> apart you're meant to be on the ground or or a, or a bush turkey things like that there's all sorts of funny things mm -hmm. but, you know Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Humor, humor always helps, yeah? Always. <laughs> thank are you there, so much. Are there any other questions? Guido. Yeah. Hello, Guido. Um, hello, hello. Hello, uh, hello. Nice to see you again. Good morning, good morning. Yeah, good to see you again. <laughs> uh, may I uh, uh, a bit broaden this discussion, uh, uh, let's say so? Uh, would you elaborate a bit more on this uh, virtual re reality uh, side? So we, I think in many aspects, we witness uh, rather a uh, quick uh, extension of those uh, uh, virtual application and other instruments and other elements, which uh, one or another way somehow helps, seems to be helps uh, us uh, uh, navigate in in both public and virtual spaces. Uh, how would you see this uh, new coming virtual uh, navigation tools and uh, uh, and and which elements would you think be uh, be uh, uh, be uh, replaced or or let's say uh, uh, somehow supported this this both uh, physical structure with virtual structure? How do you see this? Uh, uh, coming uh, years, how will these both structures will interact and uh, help each other? Would you elaborate on this? I, th I think it's uh, very broad, but uh, uh, let's say shortly. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, it, it, <laughs> we, 
we are definitely still observers of that virtual reality mm -hmm. rather than active practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think um, we we see virtual reality as you know, um, or and or augmented reality is used to in you know there's apps and things that create another layer when you're in a space and you can see maybe go back in time and history. Um, we, we we haven't really investigated it for for wayfinding. Um, we you know we can't yet see how it's going to work. Um, when you're in the real world, I mean, there may be a way that somehow virtual reality is used to train you and prepare you for navigating a particular real world, but um, I, we sort of can't quite work out why. So I, I don't think we can give you any very good answers, Guido, to be honest, because we're not we're not very at the cutting edge, of, you know, at the cutting edge of that field. Um, I'm sure lots of projects going up, particularly in probably somewhere in the Middle East you know, is places where they love to explore technology and bring and bring it into the environment. Be it, you know, big, you know, touch screens and things like that. But yeah, we I can't give you much much good advice there. Okay, I think we have a uh, short time for the last last question. Um, but yeah, well, someone is thinking about the question. There is absolutely uh, uh, open possibilities, I think, to, to talk with uh, uh, Mark and Despina. Uh, just ask us and about these possibilities, and that I, I think they will be open to answer any questions and uh, after this uh, this talk. Are there any questions or or? I have, I have another question, maybe. I have, a question. I have uh, an idea about this uh, distance thing in uh, this COVID time. I think uh, it could be a very good idea that uh, we could uh, use this uh, projections in the shops. Like we show how, uh, how it, uh, this uh, virus is in, goes uh, and uh, we just, when we are standing in a line, we are just showing if you are going closer, then then you see the danger and we i don't know what kind of this projection could be but i think uh, we can we could think of something like that this uh, this projection thing not just the science on the ground but something like that so it's just uh, an idea <laughs> just say uh, just yeah it's for eels <laughs> the idea how to think this so yeah and uh, thank you despin and mark about this whole <laughs> What about virtual reality that showed all the germs flying around? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Liana. And uh, sorry, but uh, Eva was also starting to ask a question. Maybe, Eva, you can finalize and ask uh, a, a short question and then... Yeah, yeah. it's a really uh, short, just um, ties together maybe with Ilse's question uh, and uh, and wanted to find out about your experience. Do you um, uh, practice uh, uh, like testing in space, the design that you have uh, created, that you've you gathered information, you created design, and, and do you practice it, making it, putting it in a place and testing it for a while before making the final decision and rolling out the, the whole system? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. We obviously try and use a lot of models and mock-ups in the studio and just to understand how things are fitting together. And it does, it's practicing and testing um, to understand, then go out into the environment. Um, it depends a little bit on the project, but we try and build occasionally some full-size sort of models, like not, not a full prototype. Um, and it does help with all those situations of saying, well, how, how big does this object look in the landscape? Is it visible? Um, is, is that issue to do with contrast, you know, legibility, how is that working? And that's a really big one of how things translate into the environment when they start to change and this lighting and shadow, different materials. So we definitely try and, um, yeah, we certainly do some level of sort of physical testing. It does depend a bit on, on the project. But 
Yeah. And I think what happens over time Eva, is, um, you know, we build up knowledge and a set of internal standards. Mm. Uh, we're up to 6,000 projects. So you have a lot of knowledge. You know, you know that from 20 metres, the reading distance has to be this height. You know you have to have colour contrast. You know it has to be different for, you know, for a pedestrian to, so to a vehicle or a cyclist. So, yeah, um, we, do, we do testing, um, but you know, after a while you have a set of standards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, then I would say uh, thank you all for being here and taking part in this, uh, this talk and, and, and asking questions, raising some discussions. And of course, uh, I would say thank you to Inguna, Despina and Mark for sharing your knowledge, for sharing your experience and raising this uh, theme about uh, wayfinding design uh, that we feel this is very actual also in Latvia, but not only in Latvia. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, if you would like, if someone is interested in uh, any uh, events uh, uh, regarding design, uh, we as the SEGD uh, Riga chapter are going to organize uh, four uh, events next year. And just uh, take a look in our Facebook or, or LinkedIn and you will get uh, the newest information and uh, get, get possibility to take part in design events and to talk about this. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to everybody today. And we, you know, we are open, <laughs> open for more discussion. Uh, I would say uh, we are waiting you back after all this situation will uh, go down together with Mark uh, to, to see what's uh, new in Riga and in Latvia. Yeah, yeah. it's wonderful. We, we cannot wait. Okay. But we will have to wait for a little while, as you okay. know. <laughs> it's a okay. beautiful country. There's a the wonderful hospitality, just beautiful. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and have a nice Friday evening. And for us, have a nice Friday day. Thank yep. you. Bye. Bye.